So bear with us or with me through this because I'm going to have two basic parts to my presentation, uh, both having to deal with uh, imperialism and with the historical processes which have produced the present British imperial system which rules the world. So on the one hand, I'll take up where Robbie left off at the end of the Great Astrogation uh, Age when empires were first established when the system of empire was established, which has ruled mankind most of the time ever since. And in the second major part of my presentation, I'll take up where Elisa left off, uh, with the Venetian counterattack against uh, the Renaissance with the imperial institutions uh, and the specific kinds of ideology they created as part of that process. Now, if you don't know this long wave of uh, history as I've discovered, you really don't understand much of anything about how the world functions today and of our own role actually within that. But it's not, a just, it's not just a matter of learning some of the facts, but of actually pre-living that history in your own mind. So as far as we can see at present, what we've, um, through Robbie's class, the, during the great global melt, melt at the end of the last ice age, around 18,000 to 5,000 BC, when you had sea levels that rose uh, by hundreds of feet uh, very rapidly. And of course, civilization underwent a time of great upheaval and cultural shifts. Now, you've probably all heard about the uh, myths or traditions in virtually all cultures worldwide of the Great Flood. Now, from all we know, the institution of oligarchism, the rule of mankind by empires, dates from this period of upheaval and the disruption of the previously ruling great astrogation cultures, which of course were located on the coasts of the world's oceans and therefore vulnerable to this rapid flooding. Now, we're talking about probably 12,000 BC or so, and from that time until today, mankind has been ruled most of the time with a few precious but short-lived ex uh, exceptions by tyrannical empires. And any empire, by its very organising principles, is necessarily tyrannical. So what I hope to do today is to show to you that the establishment of the institutions and principles of empire from around 12,000 BC or so gave birth to certain traditions, traditions of culture and of ruling institutions. Now, of course, with traditions comes a certain kind of method of thinking. So in this class today, I'll go through some of the detail of how these institutions and traditions were established which is crucial, but more importantly, I'll try and give you some insight on the cultural condition, traditions of empire, i.e. the control of methods by which we in this room think, at least most of the time anyway, by methods by which most of us make decisions of what is right or wrong, what's practical or impractical. Now, right behind me over here, I should say today, if Jeremy wants to uh, just grab it for a minute. We all know the Australian flag, don't we? Aha! <laughs> uh Aha! -huh. Uh -huh. Now, I'm going to give you an example of how traditions, right, this method of thinking, are transmitted over thousands of years into the present. Now, uh, for those who know, it could be quiet, but who can tell me what this flag is composed of? <laughs> yes, what else? Yeah, don't. I, I would, I, that's why I wouldn't have it up here behind me. <laughs> All right, any other? Who, who said that? Yeah. They're represented by who? St. George, St. Patrick, St. Andrew, and St. George, right? Hey? 
<laughs> All righty. St. George, St. Patrick, and of course St. St. Andrew, right, which is the Union of Britain. Right? This is really a British flag. But do you know where St. George comes from? <laughs> Barnaby Joyce's country. Okay. I'm not going to give you the answer to that, right? To where this main cross right here in the middle of our flag comes from. As I'm going to let you discover it for yourself during the course of this presentation. Now, uh, as we saw with Robbie's presentation yesterday, the cognitive evidence of the development of mankind and maritime you know, cultures, is existed for many hundreds of thousands of years. So in order to, you can put that now down there, Jeremy. <laughs> oh, sorry, Jeremy. Um, so in order to recap, I want to start with uh, Lynn's statement on the origins of oligarchism. Can you just hit the next slide there? As Lynn said, we are informed to divide prehistory into three broad categories. First, there is a large catch-all category. This is followed by the pre-Olympium age typified by Uranus in the Atlantean account reported by Diodorus Cyclicus. This age we identify as the astronomical age, during which astronomical, astronomically sophisticated calendars were developed probably to the maximum degree of refinement as to the scientific principles they ever reached thereafter until modern times. The Great Crisis ushers in an irrationalist astrological age of the Olympians in which the calendar is preserved and observations are often continued, but in which the scientific point of view needed to produce such calendar designs is more or less suppressed. This astrological age is the origin of oligarchism. Now, however, as a result of this astronomical age, revolutionary advances were made not just in astronomy and astronomical calendars, but by 11,000 BC, that's brought to us through the written accounts of Plato, a great civilization centered in Egypt flowered, constructing pyramids as astronomical observatories uh, the development and introduction of agriculture were ac accomplished, which in turn, this Egypt sponsored uh, the rise of classical Greece, of Homer, Aeschylus, Socrates and Plato, and many other great minds that produced one of the most advanced societies through art and science through the development of, natural, of the natural creative powers of mankind for the good of all mankind. Now, of course, what was the origins of the institution of oligarchism? Well, it was within the, the process, this process against the, this impulse of what you could say, the early ideas of republicanism, the astrological age of the Olympians, the origin of oligarchism erupted. The birth of the gods of Olympus, according to Roman historian uh, Diodorus, was that the peoples of the sea which was a branch of the original great astrogation cultures, but degenerated over time, established a colony in the Atlas Mountains of modern day Morocco, which I just wanted to get you a satellite view there so you could see the great you know, um, expanse of the Atlantic Ocean. And I can tell you, I really struggled you know, with this perplexing question on whether or not the gods of Olympus actually existed. Or was it just a myth, right? In fact, this became very, very instructive in just how much over the transition of millenniums we are still so much influenced by the oligarchical in fa uh, fact, uh, creations. In fact, LaRouche emphasised that this is the gist of the matter because the Atlanteans of the Roman Empire times, i.e. those residents of the uh, Atlas Mountains, whom Siculus interviewed, Diodorus that is, insisted that the Olympian pantheon and its cognates around the world were a hoax. The Olympians had defied themselves and imposed this hoax upon superstitious peoples 
they had colonised is the gist of the matter, as LaRouche said. Now, you already get a good sense of the long waves of history, right, so to speak, just in the word of Atlantic, right, as an Atlantic Ocean, which dates back to this Atlas Mountains Atlantean culture. So, how did the astrological age of the Olympians, the origin of oligarchism, erupt? Well, the king of the Atlante Atlantean kingdom, Uranus, Uranus I should say, who was an epic figure whose name is used to designate sky in Greek. Now he had two sons, Cronus and Atlas, who had co-administered a far-flung domain. Now a, far, a, a, a factional war erupted between the children of Cronus's wife, Olympia, and his other wives, right? Now the children of Cronus's wife were one faction called the Titans, after their mother's maiden name, and then the other children were part of the other faction called the Olympians, that were led by Zeus. Now the Olympians defeated the Titans, and Zeus then led the Olympians and imposed brutal you know, uh, tyranny throughout the empire, or the maritime settlements of the Mediterranean. The Olympians portrayed themselves as gods, as an imperial oligarchy, which would rule and enslave mankind forever. Now, through their tyranny, they would not just suppress the natural creative powers of mankind, but torture any of those who would dare bring and develop that creative potential. And of course, that Zeus there, sitting on his throne, which is the same image that you can use for the environmentalists today, right, of banning, you know, banning technology, banning that creative, you know, potential within the human beings. Now, the great playwright Aeschylus wrote about the, the evil of the Olympians in his famous trilogy about the god Prometheus, whose very, you know, name means forethought. Now, Prometheus had not just brought fire to the people, but he'd brought the idea that man could uplift his standard of living from an animal-like animal existence and free himself from that tyranny if he truly developed right, that creative potential. Now, for doing so, Prometheus was chained to a rock where an eagle would uh, eat out his entrails for all, into all eternity unless he capitulated to the demand of Zeus to reveal the secret of how Zeus and the Olympians would cause their own downfall as had been prophesied, which prophecy was driving Zeus and the Olympians crazy. Now a little look, a bit like uh, Prince Philip and his incredible shrinking queen of today. You know, when faced with us or LaRouche's, um, 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 you know, ideas. Now Aeschylus wrote a trilogy of plays on this theme, of which only the second play survives. The third concluding play depicts the fall of the gods and the triumph of uh, Prometheus aided humanity over the Olympian imperial rule. So the idea of institutionalism, of, of oligarchism... Excuse me, Gabby. Can, can everybody turn their mobile phones off, please? Or check that they've got it turned off? Yeah, bad people. <laughs> <laughs> so the in, institution of oligarchism was to be used as the body to crush the cognitive development of man, because it's now been created, not just for the period of the Atlanteans, but to be perpetuated across successive generations as a cultural movement, as LaRouche said. So we have the Olympus story from Diodorus Siculus, Plato in a different way, back to around 12,000 BC years ago. But then as we move into recorded history, um, you know, to around 3000 to 4000 BC, we will pick up the story from there in Asia and South, Southeast, uh, Southwest Asia. Now, just to give you a sense of the regions that we're talking about, um, you know, these are the, the, the three major empires of this period. But this was after a series of uh, other dynasties and empires. And what we're going to move to is the modern period with the Assyrian Empire, which was established around 900 BC, right, which was a financier priesthood that emerged as the central epistemological, political and financial force within the success of Assyrian, 
than the Babylonian and of course Persian empires, the Mesopotamian cultures. Now of course this priesthood was known as the Chaldeans. Now the Chaldean culture had more than likely come from the evil degenerate Harappan culture which had moved from the Indus uh, Valley, which is India, to the region of Sumer in Mesopotamia. You know, with their great uh, big Mother Earth goddess culture. In fact, this Harappian uh, uh, goddess, Shakti, is clearly the same goddess as the Chaldean Ishtar, identified by the uh, New Testament as the Whore of Babylon. So the Harappan and Mesopotamian cultures were basically identical. And the Chaldeans were the vehicle for, for the transplanting of the Harappian culture into Mesopotamia. Now, coming with the Chaldeans, obviously they had a huge mastery of the astronomical discoveries regarding the motion of the planets, particularly the precession of the equinoxes and so forth. And they acquired that from the earlier astrogation you know, cultures. But what they did is they turned this knowledge into astrological, religious-based kookery. They created a synthetic, mystical belief system by which a tiny oligarchy could rule over the vast ignorant masses of the population. Right? What did they create? Well, needless to say, the Chaldeans are the sponsors of Your Day by the Stars. <laughs> Who goes to the newspaper to get their day by the stars? <laughs> I'm sure there's a few of you in here. All right? <laughs> the age of Aquarius, right? Remember, the, the, this is the age of Aquarius, unleashed in the 1960s, all of you of this generation, or most of you, designed, you know, to, to deliberately, to bring about the babbling irrationalist cult of me and Bobby McGee and sex, drugs, rock and roll, the counterculture that has shaped the way, you know, in one way or another, the, the way every baby boomer thinks. Now, as part of this synthetic belief system, the Chaldeans preached also a Gnostic dualist, dualist worldview that the devil must be worshipped as well as God. As one historian put it, he said, quote, the Magi specified that evil must be worshipped also and must be considered. There was no miracle the experienced magician might not expect to perform with the aid of demons, providing he knew how to master them. He would invent any atrocity in his desire to gain favour of the evil divinities, whom crime gratified and suffering pleased. All the satanic refinement that a perverted imagination in a state of insanity could conceive pleased the malicious evil spirits. Now, this is a real Bernard Mandeville paradise, the early 18th century Anglo-Dutch philosopher who said that out of private vice comes the public good. Well, think about it. It's okay, we've got gambling houses, right? Private vice, but what's the public good that they spruik? Taxes, right? So, the, the, you know, you have to think about this, this process of what they're saying about evil. You know, you can, you can worship evil as well as the good. So, um, and later on, you'll see some of this satanic worshipping of the devil adopted by the Hellfire Club uh, founder Francis Dashwood as part of the 1688 Glorious Revolution cultural imports from Venice. Okay, so the Chaldeans, they were a financier priesthood. Their central temple, for, for instance, controlled perhaps as high as 50% of the land in the entire kingdom. And they handled all the foreign trade and all diplomacy. Now, over the centuries or even millennia, the Chaldeans would organise different tribes at different tri times into different ruling dynasties. From uh, Mesopotamia, Right, stretching all the way up into Georgia, Armenia and the Caucasus. Now they either organised through war or financial and political deals, one after the other tribes such as the Assyrians, the Medeans and the Persians. They'd be anointed to run the empire for a while 
and it's exactly like the shift the Venetians organised in Amsterdam to the Dutch dynasty and then to London, the British dynasty. And of course when one you know, tribe grew too fat or too degenerate, um, you know, they'd, uh, to keep the business together, the Chaldeans would consult, consult the stars. Right, and lo and behold, it was time for the next game to rule. Now the king of whatever dynasty who happens to be anointed at that moment is worshipped right, by the masses as divine, a man-god. This Chaldean system, particularly its Persian model uh, form, gave rise to the supposedly divine Caesar of the Roman Empire, but these gods were mere puppets of the Chaldeans, whose headquarters you know, for um, many centuries through various ruling dynasties was the city of Babylon. Now, all of these empires were organised around money, monetarism, which is why you uh, would have vast accumulations you know, of power um, or of apparent power and wealth, as in Babylon, and why each in turn would inevitably collapse. Because the ruling principle was money at the expense of the physical economy, precisely like today. Historically, this is no big surprise because there was an unbroken con continuity from those empires to the British Empire today which we'll discover. Now to give you an example of how the Chaldeans would pervert astronomical knowledge into mystical belief structures or religions by which they would control their empires, we'll take the case of the god Mithra who would later be a decisive force in the rise of the Roman Empire since he was the god of the Roman legions, the military force of the empire. Go to the next one. Can you guys see that? Uh, we, you guys weren't asleep in Robbie's class, were you? Do you see Orion up there? Right, your constellation of Orion. Now, just the next one, please, Jeremy. That's a closer view. And what we have um, in the constellation of Orion's belt, as you know, it's not part of the 12 constellations of the zodiac that we saw earlier. It's just, you know, situated off the ecliptic. And just below our Orion's belt, if we go back to the other one, uh, the yeah, that one. Uh, you've got the um, Orion Nebula, which is not very clear. It's where that uh, red star is. Uh, I think that's... Is it there or there? Yeah, there you are. Thank you. Um, but then you've got the, the bright star, this one down here. Right, um, that's Cyrus, known as the dog. And of course the sun is um, you know, beginning to rise on the horizon. Now, one of the extraordinary discoveries, if you just go to the next one please, Jeremy. Next one. Next one. You went back. Right. <clears throat> one of the extraordinary discoveries of the great astro astrogation cultures was the procession of the equinox. Now, of course, the equinox is the time of year when night and day are of precisely the same length, you know, which happens in the spring with the vernal equinox and um, in the fall with the autonomal equinox. Now, the complete precession cycle, as you'll see here, covers a period of more than 25,000 years or so. And it's during this time the equinox regresses a full 360 degrees through all 12 constellations as Robbie was showing yesterday of the zodiac. In other words, moving through one constellation every 2,000 years or so and, that, and thus after 12 times through the entire zodiac. Now within the procession of the equinox there are a number of other cycles but the key one for us right now is the vernal equinox when the sun is moving directly over uh, the true celestial equator or the line in the sky above uh, you know, the Earth's equator. 
giving you nearly equal day and equal night, right, uh, during that period, during that night, that day. Now, the vernal equinox happens in March in the Northern Hemisphere, and for our purposes, this was at the time when the sun passed through the constellation of Taurus. Now, the sun, this is just a, an image of it, is that there? So, uh, one of the series of dynasties which they created in Mesopotamia was the Chaldeans invited a Persian tribe into Babylon, right, in 1539 BC to take over and run the empire. Now, the Persians had an existing god known as Mithra and his priests were called the Magi, which is where the modern word magician comes from, by the way. So the, the Chaldeans basically adopted the Magi and this Mithra religion, which they reshaped towards their own ends, that of creating a warlike, martial cult in order to run the empire. And they concocted the desired belief structure by perverting astronomical knowledge into their own desired mystical form. Now, how did they do this? The Chaldeans taught that Orion, the hunter, Right. Did, can we just go back to the previous one? See the shape of uh, Orion as the hunter? Right, which that's Mithra. That's, that's Mithra. Kill Taurus, which you see the graphic there of Taurus, uh, of the constellation, right, with the picture with it. Now, this, go to the next one, please, Jeremy. This signified the previous era, that of Taurus the bull was over, right? And that, that of Orion, whom the Chaldeans now named Mithra, had begun. Which meant, in reality, this new period of Persian imperial rule had begun, which was ordained by the heavens themselves. Now, just think about what we're talking about before the age of Aquarius. This was exactly the same kind of mystical astrological belief structure of the supersession of one dynasty or one set of values by another that because the vernal equinox is now in the 20th or 21st century coming into the constellation of Aquarius instead of uh, Pisces, the fish, as previously, that Aquarian values would supersede those of the fish. And of course the fish meant Christianity. And it was a classic Christian symbol. So the killing of the bull demonstrated that Orion was the more powerful god, according to the Chaldeans and their Magi apprentices, both often known generically as the Magi from this period on. So the Magi priesthood of Mithra taught that this was a great gift by Mithra to mankind. Since the bull's life was the origin of all plants and of all varieties of species of life on earth. The creation of the world. So here you have it, right? This is Mithra slaying the bull. So the Magi is saying that Mithra was the di deity that mediated between earth and the sky for humanity which the killing of the bull actually released life right to the world. So you know what Mithra is. Mithra is God, right? The God of creation. Now, this stuff blew me away. If you look at the two sculptures, right? Well, this one first, we'll have the second one in a minute. First of all, you have Mithra being looked over by the sun god. See on the, um, right, the sun god there. Uh, then you've got the moon goddess over here and you also have various figures. Um, you've got the dog down here which represents Cyrus, right, which is lapping up the blood actually of the um, slayed bull. And then you have a scorpion, I don't know if you can see it there. There's a scorpion somewhere in there uh, that's actually licking at the, you know, the, uh, attacking the bull's testicles. <laughs> Cross your legs, you guys. <laughs> now, these are all standard figures of um, Mithra iconography. 
Now, there's a second picture. Can you go on? Jeremy, can you do the next one? Oh, sorry, you got it. Um, now, this sculpture, these, as I said before, these are normally side by side with Mithra. Um, but I found uh, this description, which I think probably, in fact, Al agreed, is accurate. Um, and this is where the torchbearers are thought to have represented the two equinoxes, equinoxes, one pointing down and pointing up, right, uh, which the points where, you know, the zodiac crosses the celestial equator. And you see the one that's pointing up and the other down, they're both dressed in uh, Persian uh, costumes, including the figure uh, uh, and cap. It also adds weight to the idea that if the Chaldeans were working off older astrogation-centred knowledge, then the period that this refers to is probably around 4000 BC, could go back even longer to 6000 BC. As the two torch carriers more than likely represent Gemini. Now, at, if you go to the next one, please, Jeremy. Um, but around 4000 BC, at the beginning of the age of Taurus, right, got Taurus here, you got Gemini over here, and Orion down there. So, um, you know, th this is, um, that graph is actually from a picture of 4000 BC of the, um, the heavens. Now, the story and the tablet of the killing of the bull was certainly uh, placed in the underground uh, caverns and cave, uh, sorry, um, if we go to the next one, yeah, this is, um, it's really stunning in how this tradition has continued, which you'll see later. But they placed the Mithra bull statue in underground caves. They, have re they replicated it, obviously. And um, it was for rituals, it was the worship of, myth of the Mithra priesthood. The sanctums were dark and windowless and the Mithra proudly displayed like an altar, right, in the middle of the cave. The walls were adorned with the images and the names of Juno, Minerva, Apollo, Mars, Bacchus, Mercury, and Venus, depictions of the cosmos. No doubt the rituals practiced were just as evil and degenerate as their assault on astronomical knowledge. Now, the celebration of Mithra can be found in temples from England right across to the Orient. These were the type of temples that they had. So it tells you something about their vast influence. This was not just, you know, contained in a certain area. All right, go back, please. All righty, you saw the old bag. <laughs> when you saw the sun god before, right, there's a question I want to ask you because it's really Stunning, once again, of seeing these tra traditions, this, you know, passed through, you know, and perpetuated through consecutive cultures. Um, does anyone have any idea where the word crown comes from? Crown. The crowned heads of U Europe. You can put it on now. Jeremy? The crowned heads of Europe and the old bag itself. Any idea where the crown would come from? The idea of the crown? Well, think of where the, the idea of Caesar came from too. Go to the next one. Mithra, sun god. That's where this all comes from, right? It's nothing less than a Chaldean Mithraic derivative, the crown. Because it's really the sun halo around the head of the Chaldean anointed God man ruler. Hey? Yeah, yeah, decrepit old thing. I had to take out all my swear words. <laughs> Alrighty, now the whole purpose of the worshipping of Mithra was to create a well-disciplined army of men for conquests and establish an imperial martial cult to inspire the necessary willingness and enthusiasm to fight and die for a cause the priests had defined as divine. 
After all, if they're fighting for an emperor, the great Persian king, the man god, they're fighting for a divine cause and are assured of their souls going back to the Empyrean, the highest heavens. And it should be of no surprise that this became the religion of the military legions of Rome. The sun was a deity of the Mithra cult, so one day of the week was named Sun Day to be kept holy in honour of Mithra. While the 25th of December was observed as the birthday of Mithra by the Persians, which of course being in the Northern Hemisphere was the day they saw the rebirth of the winter sun on, unconquered by the rigours of the season. Right? The Roman calendar had long featured an eight-day week, but by the first century AD adopted a seven-day week. Sun Day being the day of worshipping the sun god Sol Invictus, associated with Mithra that became the religion of the Roman legions. Now, by 274 AD, Emperor Aurelian of Rome, in celebration of the Persian deity, built a temple to the sun god, dedicating it on the 25th of December, the birthday of the unconquerable sun. Just go to Sol Invictus. <coughs> Excuse me. The Chaldean created Persian Empire became known as the Archimedes Empire after one of its ruling families. All right. As you see here, the Archimedes, uh, Archimedes Empire was 550 to 330 BC. Now, it was under the direction of its ruling priesthood and as part of a plan to establish a permanent world empire, the Archimedes Empire led several brutal attempts to actually conquer the cities of Greece, which some were still, you know, in greatly influenced by the leftover vestiges of the classical Greek culture. Uh, but repeated attacks, you know, Persian attacks against Greece failed. Now, um, one of the battles, you all heard of the Battle of Marathon, yeah. right, which was in September of 490 BC. They were vastly outnumbered Greek force. They only had 10,000 men um, armed with swords, but the Persian army, right, they had 80,000 with a full division, right, of skilled archers. Now, Marathon Bay is just north of Athens there. Right. Now, of course, um, and it was many miles away from Athens. But after the, the battle, it is, beg yours, Yeah, 26 miles, isn't it, or something or other? You, you know, because the, the um, Greeks defeated the Persians. And one of the um, soldiers ran, and it was a 26 mile, isn't it, the marathon? Yeah. 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 Um, you know, announcing the victory, uh, because he, but he fell dead, right? And that's why that they call it the marathon. It's, you know, it was commemorated by, you know, the modern marathon, right? And it was run in the Olympic Games sometime, 1896. Now, of course, the Greeks had a higher culture. You know, they were fighting for actual principles. So even though the Persians always greatly outnumbered them, they could never conquer the Greek military force. Now, um, therefore, what the uh, Mesopotamian priesthood, working through the Apollo Temple, uh, the Apollo Temple at uh, Delphi, which had immense influence throughout Greece, which I'll elaborate so, some more about in a minute, they orchestrated what became known as the Peloponnesian Wars, which were 431 to 404 BC. Now, first of all, during these wars, you had Athens and her allies against Corinth and Sparta and their allies, which was, you know, eventually to the ruin of all. So from then until today, Greece has never actually recovered from those disastrous wars. And it was not long after the Chaldeans struck a deal with King Philip of Macedon for a single world empire, but constituted of two halves. That Philip would conquer Greece and, conquer, and control everything west of the Euphrates uh, River, and the Persians would control everything to the east. But the key to the whole business, and this survives in written account of that proposed deal, 
was that the whole empire was to be run on what was specified as the Persian model, right? The oligarchical principle. So if you have a look at the, you've got that there, the map of the Peloponnesian War. However, Philip died and Alexander the Great took his rightful place as leader of Athens. Now, his mother was associated with the Egyptian temple of Amon, Amon, which had maintained the great astronomical culture of the Astrogation Age. Now, it was through his mother's connections, um, you know, with uh, Amon, Alexander allied with the Egyptians and destroyed Tyre, which is basically an early day, you know, Venice, right, or city of London. Now, Tyre was the uh, bastion of the early Assyrian Empire, now part of the Persian Empire, and the maritime headquarters of usury in the Eastern Mediterranean, which was so evil that it actually gave birth to the word tyranny, right? And if you take a look at their, their religion, uh, they worshipped the gold Moloch, who was also known as Baal in the Old Testament, and they used to sacrifice their children, roasting them alive on the altars, you know, of the Moloch. Now, Alexander the Great, he only had 42,000 Greek and Macedonian troops. They were pitted against the Persian army, numbering almost a million. Alexander marched across the whole Persian Empire, right, as you see his routes, right, coming down from down here all the way through. He destroyed their imperial rule. He founded entire new cities across, you know, the uh, Persian Empire, the former empire, which are those, if you can see them, they're in, you'll see little red dots. Um, and of course, um, the former empire, you, you know, he's then spread the, the classical Greek culture everywhere he went. Now, of course, you can imagine they were furious at Alexander's triumphs. And the Apollo Delphic priesthood plotted to kill him. Now, there was two organised attempts. The first, according to existing historical records, was by Aristotle. He was a specialist in poisons. Now, that failed. But then a second attempt, also by poison, succeeded. And it was pretty clear that Aristotle, you know, ran that one also. But where Alexander had intended to conquer all of Asia to India and all uh, of the Euro Europea across to the English Channel on behalf of the classical Greek culture. Upon his death, his generals just carved up his conquests in the East into a bunch of squabbling little kingdoms. So still intent on creating a new world ruling empire, the Delphic priesthood now looked towards some of the tribes living in Italy, soon to be known in history as the Romans. Now, you cannot understand the rise of the brutal genocidal Roman Empire without understanding the two forces which created it. The cult of Mithra on the one hand and the Apollo Temple of Delphi on the other. Now, let me tell you about Apollo and then some more about one of his priests, Aristotle. Now, although he was adopted into the pantheon of gods of Olympus, the god Apollo originally came from the east right, i.e. Mesopotamia. So while his precise relationship to the Chaldeans or the cult of Mithra is not entirely clear, what is clear is that he represented that same type of Eastern financier priesthood. Already by the 5th century BC, the Apollo Temple at Delphi, Delphi held the biggest bank in the world. Now, like Mithra, Apollo was celebrated as the sun god, as well as the patron of, mus of musicians and poets. He was a really fine, upstanding fellow. But there's more to the story. His mother was one of these typical earth mother goddesses of Mesopotamia, gave birth to two sons, Apollo and Dionysius. Now Dionysius was the, good, was the god of drunken orgies and ecstasy. In fact, we have documented that the masters of British intelligence at Tavistock and at Cambridge uh, and Oxford designed the 1960s rock, drug, sex, counterculture uh, movement explicitly on the cult of Dionysius. 
One of the great heroes of that counterculture, the late 19th century so-called philosopher Fried, uh, Friedrich Nitschke, he championed the cult in order to obliterate any rem remnants of Christianity, any resistance to world imperial rule. Nitschke's war cries were, God is dead. And Dionysius... Uh, Di Dionysius. Uh, uh, he said Dionysius against the crucified. Well, it didn't work out so well for him personally because he went stark, raving mad in the latter years of his life and visitors to his apartment in Venice would sometimes find him, uh, find him dancing around naked, babbling. <laughs> All right. So if you come... I've put four of these. This one here is, a, is an artist's reconstruction. So, Apollo comes from the east to the ancient pagan site Delphi, which was then devoted to the worship of Earth Mother Gaia and her snake god consort or son, or both, Python, right? Now, arriving at Delphi, Apollo killed and chopped the python into segments and buried the remains. In dedication to Earth Mother, Apollo established the grave site, right, which is the Temple of Apollo, which is the international, that's the Temple of Apollo, that's Delphi, that's what they call it. It's a land area, right? Now, um, Delphi is known as the international centre of usury. On the one side of the grave site sat a priestess, priestess known by the title of Pythia, who would, for a hefty fee, answer questions in babbled riddles. And for a higher, higher price, the priests of Apollo would then interpret her answers for you. All right? <laughs> now, Pythia was the priestess of Mother Earth, the cult of Gaia, Gaia who would wreak vengeance against anyone who disturbed her creation. All right. Now, of course, in taking a closer look at the Temple of Apollo, you'll see them. Well, that one there, that's known as a treasury. I think that's it there. But all of these little buildings, you know, were treasuries, you know, for deposits and so forth. And in fact, where um, Delphi is situated, you've got the big bay and ocean, major port. Uh, for trade, for controlling trade right throughout the Mediterranean. Now, one of their key intelligence agents during this period was Aristotle. Now, since the Temple of Apollo was to become the model for establishing a global monetarist empire, a culture of worshipping the pagan gods, Aristotle was to become the bedrock of the philosophical ideas against the Platonic idea of man that platonic idea of men having the creative powers to increase one's power over the universe and to know the divine God, you know, that Elisa highlighted earlier. Now, Aristotle not only wrote submissions on legal matters, known as his Dicamadia for various Greek cities, but he was also at the temple getting advice from the oracle and would often send various representatives of states and individuals to consult with the oracle of Apollo. Now, Aristotle's books, The Ethics and Politics, claimed that there were no universal laws. There were only prevailing opinions. And, of course, those opinions are cooked up in the priesthood, the Temple of Apollo. Aristotle systemized another great fraud, one we still have with us today, and that's the idea of popular democracy. In writing a new Athenian constitution, he declared, quote, by these reforms, the constitution became much more democratic than that of Solon. End of quote. Now, the constitution of Solon of Athens was a forerunner and even a model in some respects for the establishment of the American Republic. But Aristotle and his Delphic mates had a very curious idea of democracy. Of course, it was all based on slavery. In fact, Aristotle championed the master-slave relationship as being natural. Mm -hmm. 
quote, that one should command and another obey is both necessary and expedient. Indeed, some things are so uh, are divided right from birth, some to rule, some to be ruled. It is clear then that by nature some are free, others are slaves, and that for these it is both just and expedient that they should serve as slaves. <laughs> End of quote. Continuing the imperial tradition, the Venetian oligarchy would later adopt Aristotle as their virtual god. One of the leaders, um, uh, their leaders, Cardinal Gasparo Contarini, not O, Contarino, e, uh, I should say, he's asleep, um, <laughs> was so versed in Aristotle that it was said that if all Aristotle's works were lost, <laughs> he could reproduce, reproduce them in their entirety. So, I was just talking about you, one of your cousins. So with the Eastern Front secured, and after centuries of bloody civil wars, the cults of Mithra and the Delphic pantheon of Rome were about to achieve their ultimate dream, a single maritime form of a unified imperial power to rule from England to India known as the Roman Empire. All right. Now, the Roman Empire was established under Octavian Augustus Caesar, 27 BC to 14 AD. He was the grandson of Julius Caesar. Now, as a result of the deal which the cults of Mithra and Apollo struck with him on the Isle of Capri, which is an island just off uh, the coast of Greece, uh, uh, Rome, he was appointed the first emperor of Rome and the Isle of Capri became sacred hereditary property of the Roman emperor for centuries. You can still see the ruins of, hu of a huge Mithra temple there. That's even today, right? Now Augustus, who was the first Roman emperor to be worshipped, Eastern style, as divine. And he declared that his Roman legions would conquer and rule mankind. And all behind it lay the Mesopotamian Magi. Now, as historian Cumont says of Augustus, quote, he said, the increasing tendency of Caesarism towards absolute monarchy made it lean more and more upon the Oriental clergy. Even Roman law was developed in the law college of Beirut, which is centered in, Mithra, in the Mithra-dominated Syria. Now, of course, Augustus was the project of the Magi, and so was his son Tiberius. Before his reign as Caesar, Tiberius spent five years on the island of Rhodes, off Greece, which was a training ground for the Magi. There he came under the tutelage of Thrasyllus, the greatest astrologist of the day, he was called, and he was known as the magician. Tiberius relied on Thrasyllus uh, for his fortune telling for the next 40 years. Now, when Tiberius became the emperor of Rome and gave the order uh, from Capri to crucify Jesus Christ, there is little doubt that Thrasyllus was standing in the shadows. He was also there while Tiberius engaged in all sorts of uh, kinds of sexual perversity including raping little boys and then throwing them off to the cliffs, off the cliffs to the rocks below. Now, of course, while the Roman legions looted and rampaged throughout the entire Mediterranean and all the way to England, the Roman population was kept docile, right, through bread and circuses with over 200 public holidays. But look around us today. We've already had two in the last two weeks. You know, how much entertainment do we have? Celebrating the hero worshipping. Anything from sports stars, right? And the Hollywood circuses. Now, as most of you know, we have a very serious political problem in Australia. Matt knows it. It's called populism. <laughs> right? And it comes straight from the Roman Empire. Via Venice and then London. The Latin term, populari, 
from which the, ter the, the terms populace or popular derive actually means predators. That is, the populari, the predatory mob, would regularly be whipped up by the oligarchy toward desired ends. Pauline Hanson, anyone? Do you want to hold the flag again, Jeremy? <laughs> but of course, before you laugh really at the, you know, the pitiful obvious example, you ask yourself, how much am I infected by populism? Might that be, you know, for instance, why I don't deploy out on the streets each week? Right? Or when I do, that I'm half scared to death, that I'm afraid to challenge the usually idiotic beliefs of my fellow citizens. This tradition of wanting to be liked, right, to be popular, is a cultural disease passed down directly from the days of the Roman Empire. So let me make this more explicit. First with a question from the present day. How many of you can name the crucial single incident that which led to actually all of us sitting in this room today without our you know full-time guys blurting it out? <laughs> no, sitting in this room today, what single crucial incident? No, you <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What led to us sitting in this room here today? <laughs> I know who it was. I'm bringing him up after the conference. It's all right. He came from South Australia. Yeah. <laughs> All right, anyone, anyone would like to hazard a guess? The guy, he, he's the fall guy for the organisation. <laughs> well, think about it, you know, for something to be created, something, someone has to create it, right? Sorry? No, no, yeah, yeah, that's true. No, I told you to come. <laughs> but if you, if you think about the history of the CEC, you know, what happened is a crucial point. Because despite its good intentions to the CEC in the early days, it was a populist organisation, right? It, Pauline Hanson, eat your heart out. <laughs> so, how was Craig able to refound it? And on what basis? Yeah. It was on the precise basis that Christian, or Christianity organised a revolt against the evil that was Rome and lay the foundations for what would emerge to create a new kind of civilization in, in the Golden Renaissance almost a thousand years later. The concept, as that Craig will tell you, Imago Viva Dei, that man is created in the living image of God. And it was this concept, an understanding of it, and an internal emotional commitment to this profound most powerful reality, which enabled Christianity to spread, despite all the kinds of hideous, you know, persecutions and murder. Modern civilization was born to a very large degree, as Lynn has said before, watered by the blood of so many Christian saints and martyrs. Civilization, ever since, has been shaped by this single concept of Imago Viva Dei, either the fight by the Romans, the Byzantines, 
the Venetians and the Anglo-Dutch to exterminate it. Or by our faction, right, to organise society here on Earth entirely on this basis. And since this fight, you know, has raged for some two millennia now and is really at the heart of all that we in the LaRouche movement and the CEC are doing, I just want to clarify a bit of what we're talking about. Persecution and murder didn't stop the spread of Christianity. In fact, it probably accelerated it. So the more sophisticated, right, of the pagan priesthood of the Mithra cult and the cult of Apollo back then, or of the Venetians and British today, schemed to adopt Christianity but in name only, leaving out the reality which motivated Christians to die in the Roman arena if necessary. Plato and the classical Greeks had taught that there was a single, all-wise, all-good creator who had created everything and that the process of creation was ongoing forever. Not fixed once and for all, way back when, like Aristotle claimed, right? But in Greek language, this all-powerful creative force was called the Logos. In English, the Word. For Christians, however, as recounted in the opening chapters of the book of St. John, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that was Jesus Christ. He was a man, but he was divine. But the essence of his divinity was as the Word, the Creator. And therefore, the essential divine-like aspect of men and women walking in the footsteps of Christ, walking in his image, in his image is creativity. That is their personal relation to God. That is what makes them Imago Viva Dei. And that is the revolutionary advance of Christianity, beyond the best of what the Greeks had contributed, even though it is implicit in, for instance, the, theory of uh, the story of Prometheus. And that power of individual personal creativity, the exercise of divine-like creativity, almost at will, is the stunning power that allows man to become a co-creator of the universe along with God himself. And it's that divine power of creativity which allows mankind to reshape his social relations, the fundamental principles upon which society itself is constructed so that he can intervene to change the physical universe as in the question of cosmic radiation today. Now the reality of this power of creativity is the essence of everything Lynn does. This is who he is. It's the source of his extraordinary power. But it's not just Lynn who has the power, but each and every one of us. And as you probably know, Lynn demands, sometimes very forcefully, that the rest of us slough off this pagan, you know, traditions of the last few thousand years or so. And of course today it's now known as empiricism and become actually human, actually creative. And that we have to do that if we're going to come out of this crisis the worst in history of mankind, certainly at least in recorded history. So if you understand this issue of personal creativity, of the concept of Imago Dei, then all of history, all of science opens up for you. Because this is the central issue of everything. And this is the same thing as the shift from the type A to the type B identity which Craig spoke about yesterday. Now I emphasise that here because the battle right now to either develop the power of Imago Viva Dei or to suppress it is the essence of all human history, in particular of all the history which I will now relate to you. So with this divine power Christianity 
grew ever stronger, even as the Roman Empire grew more degenerate. Between 303 AD and 311, Emperor Diocletian ordered that all Christian soldiers be murdered within the Roman legions and the rest make sacrifices to the pagan gods as a desperate, desperate attempt to stop this new social power released among mankind. And here I want to give you an example, right, of another cultural t tradition passed down from Rome. In fact, um, you know, from even before Rome because it exemplifies the attempt to adopt a phony form of Christianity in order to neutralize it and put it on Jeremy. How many of you are familiar with the um, St. George slaying the dragon? All heard the story or know something about it? The legend of George <laughs> the legend of George was based on George Cappadocia, right? He was a brutal archbishop of Alexandria. He was an Arian, that is, though supposedly Christian. He believed and even propagandized for the idea that Christ was not human and not and uh, sorry, was not human and divine, but only human. His uh, Iranianism, as well as his brutality in reinforcing it, was lawful. Now, Cappadocia was um, in the Archimedes Empire that was run by the Chaldean magic and its Mithra priesthood. Now, when Roman uh, Emperor Constantine adopted Christianity uh, as the state church to better control it, including by holding the right to pursuit to, um, um, to appoint all of its bishops, its top officials, he appointed George as one of his key bishops since Alexandria would become a crucial city, particularly as a key port for a maritime empire. Now, after the establishment of the British East India Company as the greatest power in the world as of the 1763 uh, following the British victory in the Seven Years' War, East India Company head Lord Shelburne assigned his stooge Edward Gibbon to write a tome called Rise and Decline of the Roman Empire. Its theme was that Christianity caused the fall of the mighty Roman Empire, right? And that if our present British Empire is going to be eternal, then we have to wipe out the essential principles underlying Christianity. Now, Gibbon loved everything Roman, believe you me. And in 1765, he formed the Roman Club, club as per Lord Shelburne's design. And as you might expect, Gibbon, in his book, was a great champion of George Cappa uh, Cappadocia, the so-called Saint George. Now, consider the standard picture of Saint George slaying the dragon, right? with the earlier story of Apollo. What do you notice? Basically the same thing, isn't it? It's pretty obvious, huh? Okay, next OHP, or slide I should say, showing my age. By 1190, England and the City of London adopted the St George's flag, a red cross on a white flag for the protection of their ships as they entered the Mediterranean during the Crusades. And the English monarch paid a fee to the Doge of Venice for the privilege. <laughs> By 14th century, St George had been declared both the patron, saint, and the protector of the royal family, and has remained a symbol on the English uh, uh, flag. Next one, please. I was just trying to find some graphics, <laughs> and all of a sudden this popped up. That's, that's a pound coin, British pound coin, right? Go to the next one, please, Jeremy. So you see, oh, the, you'll see the version of this um, painting of St. George. I, I'll tell you about later. But you see on the back of the soldiers, um, uh, on the back of him there, 
there's St. George's Cross, and there's the British flag, which is St. George's Cro Cross, St. Patrick and St. Andrew, which was the Union of Britain, Ireland, Scotland, and Britain, right? Jeremy, do you want to hold up the flag? Back one. <laughs> Come on, please, Jeremy. <laughs> Good on you, Jim. Would you mind holding it up? Stand on one leg. <laughs> What's, leave, leave that, oh. Yeah, it doesn't matter. No, it's okay. What do you see, everybody? Are you shocked? Oh my God. Just put on the overhead again. Come on, you guys. You're not shocked. This is the oh-so-subtle embracement of an Australian symbol. It's our identity. Just like the Roman legions, all right, we sent our men. God give king and country, slaughtered for, the, for this traditional bullshit to fight and die for a cause under the crown. The priests had defined as divine. Anzac Day, look at it all. And, and you can't ignore this because they're deeply held beliefs. They're deeply you know, cultural traditions. So that's something to think about, right? The perpetuation of traditions over millenniums. Millennia, I should say. All right, we can continue. Just go to the next one. Yes. However, under the collapsing Roman Empire, by 330 AD, Emperor Constantine packed up and moved the capital of the empire to the new Rome into the much richer regions of the east at the mouth of the Black Sea, Constantinople. The Byzantium Empire was thereby established that replaced but continued that of Rome. However, back in Rome, a short time later, Julian the Apostate took the reins. Now, he was a very short-lived emperor. He ruled from 355 to 360 AD and was called the Apostate because he'd written a famous treaty Contra Galileos, an imprecation, damning curse against Christianity. Now, he favoured religious liberalism. You can do whatever you please, do whatever you want, except actual Christianity, right? Well, believe whatever you want, I should say. He then issued a decree of religious freedom, rebuilt the pagan temples of Delphi, Delphi and ended banishment of religious exiles and resu resumed persecuting Christians. And it was this method of creating a veritable Heinz 57 of varieties of cults, right, that the Venetian priest Paolo Sarpi would later adopt to unleash religious warfare after the 15th century uh, Renaissance to destroy its legacy. Now, Julian was the patron saint of the English 1688 Glorious Revolution, which the Brits still claim today as the foundation stone of all modern Britain. And then he was adopted by Lord Shelburne and his pretty British East India Company crowd, who put a renewed emphasis on him after Britain's imperial tri triumph in the 1763 Treaty of Paris at the conclusion of the Seven Years' War. All right, you've got Julian up. Now, Julian himself, has been stated by many a historian as reviving Mithraism. <coughs> Julian bragged, our God is more powerful than the Christian God. And he set, he set up not just one God, but a whole hierarchy of gods in his words, which he said, quote, corresponds to a hierarchy on earth. You know, the one led you know, by himself, obviously. Julian stole, styled himself as the emperor of the emperors and kings, reflecting on earth the will of God. 
He attacked Jesus Christ for being an, a, 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 an anarchist and creating disorder among the lower classes. Julian claimed, quote, the idea of an incarnation of God is absurd. And that pro proclamation, of course, is aimed at the idea of Imago Dei. Now, despite frantic efforts by Julian and his successors, the Roman Empire continued to disintegrate. Between 410 AD and 455 AD, as civil and religious wars engulfed Rome, the last of the Roman nobles fled north, right? And they gathered what wealth they could, what property they could carry, and sought refuge in the marshy uh, lagoons of what we today call Venice. All right. Now, before we go to Venice, um, like all empires, the Byzantines, right, schemed to rule the world. Their big problem, however, was the great Charlemagne. If you just go to the um, next OHP, please, Jeremy, sorry. Now, Uh, yeah, just, yeah, I think there's a mess up there. Anyway, um, the Byzant, so, yeah, go back one, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 forward, forward, forward. Anyway, the Byzantine Empire won. Anyway, I left it out. I just wanted to show you the Byzantine. But anyway, they schemed to rule... Um, you know, the world at this point. Their big problem, however, was Charlemagne. Now, though he bore the title of Holy Roman Emperor, his policies were actually diametrically opposed to those of the earlier Mithra Apollo run Roman Empire. In fact, his key advisors were devout Irish Christians, Christian priests, who'd actually kept actual Christianity alive in Ireland during the long centuries when the Roman Empire had virtually wiped it out in Europe itself. Now Charlemagne, Charlemagne terrified the Byzantines by defending the general welfare of all. He actually created a new monetary system on a silver standard to facilitate trade and productions and constructed great new transportation systems on, the, on Europe's river systems or Europe's rivers, uh, including much of the Rhine and the Danube, which you see that Blue, blue line through the centre there. This is known as the canal. That was only finished in, actually in the 20th century, his work. And he also planned a great canal through France to connect uh, the North Sea with the Mediterranean. Now he was challenging Byzantine's maritime centred empire. Now also Charlemagne allied himself with the great Caliph of Baghdad, Harun al-Rashid, he was, one of, he was the most powerful ruler in the Middle East. The Byzantines built up their, their outpost in Venice. This was to be used as a weapon against Charlemagne, which is how Venice really actually expanded its power originally. Now Charlemagne knew his enemies very well, both the Byzantine Empire and its outposts uh, in Venice, um, uh, and both of which were trying to destroy his revival of civilization by funding the Viking marauders from Scandinavia and through other means. So Charlemagne sent his son Pippin to conquer Venice, which he did, at, at, at least until Venice later revolted. Sometimes, uh, as then, the Byzantine oligarchy was in opposition to the Byzantine emperor. And in this case, it was, empress, uh, it was the empress. So Charlemagne tried to exploit that division and take over the Byzantine Empire peacefully. Now how he did it was first of all he tried to marry the Byzantine Empress uh, and when that fell through he tried to marry uh, his son to, to a daughter so as to gain the throne. But att both attempts failed unfortunately they were foiled by Bi the Byzantine oligarchy. If you have a look at the next map, the, the next major event in Europe was the unleashing of the Crusades by Venice and the Papacy. Now it controlled, which it controlled during this period. 
Now, Venice intended to use the Crusades to establish a new financial order in Western Europe through the papacy, which, with the help of the nations, was collecting a fortune across Europe for this holy purpose. Now, Venice also wanted to finish the pro project that it had been involved in since around 1000 AD, which was the conquest of the rich lands in the middle of the Middle East and, of course, of the Levant, which included the area around the Black Sea, Constantinople. And it also went down through Syria into what is known today as Lebanon, Israel and Palestine, which were some of the wealthiest areas in the world during this period, and still, still are. Now, of course, that's where the Crusades were going. Even more importantly, this would allow them to seize control of the trade routes, which ran onto the extraordinary riches of Persia, modern Iran today, India and China. Now, as part of this process of looting Europe and tying it up in religious warfare, the Venetians organised the famous Norman invasion of England, which was in 1066, and the brutal defeat of the Saxons there, which was the, uh, the reality of the First Crusade. Now, the Normans were a bunch of Venetian-run thugs, though sometimes they had fights with them. After 1066, the Venetians sent the Normans on what history books record as the first official crusade, uh, which of course is um, uh, in 1095. By the end of, I don't have that one in, Jeremy, it's okay. By the end of the Fourth Crusade, uh, which was 1202, 1204, Venice had replaced the Byzantine Empire with her own far-ranging uh, maritime empire. And it was just typical of another dynastic you know, shift, as we saw earlier. That's all this is. All right, that's an aerial of Venice. Now, of course, what this enabled you know, Venice to internationally centralise was the control and organisation of money. She, Venice, dictated that all exchange of silver and, and gold bullion in the vast territories under her sway could only occur in Venice itself. At the same time, she recruited the Mongol emperor, who was a hideous mass murderer, Genghis Khan, as her ally to conquer the final frontier, which was China. The Mongols were nothing more than a fascist police apparatus for the entire East and looted China and the Venetians, uh, before the Venetians. Now, they'd already crushed most of China's food production with stampeding raids across, you know, the nation. And then they took China off gold in favour of uh, the silver standard, um, which is uh, the silver was to come from Europe via the Venetians. So an un unimaginable quantities of, of gold now flowed out of China into Venice. All right, if we go to the next. Now, <laughs> what you have in Venice is exactly what you have in Delphi. There was an aristocratic priesthood organised around the bank and no doubt the biggest bank in, in world history. Now the administration around the bank was called the uh, Procuratia, Pro, Procuratia and its administrators were called Procurators. Now as you look at these pictures of St Mark's Square in Venice you'll see those two long buildings either side Right, they housed um, um, the procurator, procurators. Right, on the left were the old houses, the Vecchi, and on the right were the new houses, who were known as the Nuvi. Um, since they had to expand with the growth of Venice, Venice's imperial power, right, financial power, these houses actually grew. Now, what you have? Can you go to the next one, please, Jeremy? What you have is the symbol, and this is painted by uh, Canaletto, right, who Lisa mentioned this morning. Then you have the symbol of the Serenissima, the Serene Republic of Venice. That is the line of St. Mark, right, which he's up there, right. Um, 
You also see the domes. <laughs> they were from Byzantine, Can Constantinople, the last uh, crusade. Now, of course, the line of St. Mark, this is truly Venice's proud acknowledgement of their unbroken pagan spiritual tradition. Back through Rome to Delphi and to Delphi's mother, Babylon. As an aside, the reason they call the Church of St. Mark, which was built uh, uh, in the 9th century, for the bones of St. Mark, right, one of Jesus' apostles. <laughs> now, rumour has it, what the Venetians did is that they smuggled these bones out of Alexandria by, in a pork barrel <laughs> to Venice, right? Um, and these winged lions of ancient Babylon could never confuse, if you go to the next one, please, Jeremy. These are your winged lines. That's the one that sits on top of the Church of St. Mark. These are the winged lines of uh, Babylon. And these come out of the, you know, Persian Empire. All right. But, you know, the key thing is Babylon, you know, which you could never confuse anyone that this was some sort of place of Christian worship. This was not what St. Mark's was, right? But, lo and behold, guess what else they have there? St. <laughs> uh, George and the Dragon. All right. Oh, do you already put it up? You spoiled my punchline. <laughs> um, Okay, this is um, from one of the books that Elise has been reading. This is an OHP of, uh, sorry, a slide of uh, St. George and the Dragon by Lorenzo Bregno. Thank you. It, it's situated on the Molo, <laughs> which is a ceremonial stone uh, landing in, uh, in the front of the Doge's palace. Now, in front of them, and has two big wing, uh, two big columns with the winged lions sitting on top of them. All right. The next one. This is uh, Saint George and the Dragon by uh, Vittori Carpaccio. Carpaccio. It's uh, known at the island of San Giorgio Maggiore. <laughs> Maggiore. Yeah, which is Saint George. Major, an island off the coast of Venice. All right, that's the one that you saw earlier. I just want to point out before we go on, if you can see these images down the bottom, you talk about, you know, which is like your, your panel. They've got a woman in a pot cooking. I mean, these are really, really quite evil, unless you take a look at the detail. Look at all the death. And, you know, I'm, I'm convinced I haven't, um, sort of work this out, but I'm convinced it's a it's a um, representation of the you know the priesthood because you've got you know the church in the background, you've got all these gatherings and so forth. And if you go to the next one, Jeremy, thanks. Um, you talk about the defining point of an East-West Empire. Because this St. George and the Dragon by Francesco Massini, Messina is in Cyprus, which the Chini Foundation, this is this Italian book that Elise has got, um, you know, which is the extension of the Venetians in today. Um, they proudly present this in the book, which shows that you have um, Cyprus, which is the Eastern Mediterranean. You know, this is a declaration of, of an East West unified single empire. And that's what they were celebrating, yeah? Dragon uh, characterized the nations. The you know, when you put all these nations together, it looks like a dragon. The dragon characterizes the yeah. nations. Yes. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a whole. Oh, that would be imperial. The, the dragon characterizes the nations. It's like a metaphor. Yeah, it's a metaphor. Yeah. It protects the empire as well. Is that what it symbolizes? Well, no. Think of temple. You know, Apollo slashing the python. It's, it's a metaphor of we are the Olympians. Actually, 
you know, the cult of Delphi because the Mithra and Apollo were the same thing. They both came from the east, right? And, and everything that, that comes from that, that, you know, flows from that, all the evil, you know. So with the, the Venetians celebrating, you know, the priesthood celebrations, we're the world empire. Over the centuries, you know, as the pool of liquidity, their, their fondi, which is Italian for family funds, grew, the number of procurators also increased. All were drawn solely from a handful of the most powerful Venetian families, known as the patricians, and it was usually only from among uh, that, um, sorry, it was usually only from among that the pro procreators selected the doge, you know, from the Latin dux or duke. As in the temple of Apollo, the church was the bank and the center of intelligence and cultural warfare. And everything was organized around this bank as the procuratia, a uh, procre procurator served as a depository for tax collections of the commune, as a strong box for private individuals, as a depository for flight capital from all over Europe, as the treasury for massive gifts bestowed on St. Mark, as the depository of charitable trusts, as the depository for inalienable dowries of the Venetian family of uh, female patricians, as a depository for the, uh, for the ecclesiastical Jews, as probably the leading source of funds for the state debt, and finally, and most crucially, as the fiduciary, the trustee, of many of the great Venetian family fortunes. Many of the funds in the Church of St. Mark were assigned in perpetuity. So the procurator became ever more powerful as the centuries rolled on. The Venetians also sponsored the rise of its junior powers in Florence, such as the Peruzzi bankers and the House of Bardi. Now that the Venetians had created a monopoly of both precious metals and could determine at any given moment how much gold or silver was in circulation and at what price, they could also change these ratios as they frequently did, establishing the wildest floating, exchange, uh, floating currency exchange system ever. However, by the end of the 15th century, as Elise has demonstrated this morning, things began to change with the rise of the, the sovereign nation state under King Louis XI of France, who was 1423 uh, to 83, and Henry VII of England, 1457 to 1509. Now, apart from uplifting the population into a new cultural dynamic of the common good, one of the biggest threats to the Venetians was the, fact, was the fact that both France and England, under the leadership of Louis and Henry, took control of their own coinage, which is the cornerstone of a developing nation. Being in charge of your own credit to develop one's nation. No, develop one's nation. During, the war, uh, during the War of the League of Cambrai from 1510 to 1513, a number of European powers, including the newly created powerful nation of France, revolted against Venice's imperial power and almost wiped her out. The life or death crisis for Venice, which had actually been caused by the establishment of nation states for the first time and exacerbated by the discovery of, of new and more effective routes to the Indies around the Cape of Good Hope, set in motion a chain of developments which exploded in 1582. One of the biggest factional fights in the history of Venice. These were between the old houses of Venice, known as the Vecchi, and the new houses called the Nuvi, which of course all mean the young, the Giovanni. Now, even since Cambrai, the Venetians had been moving a lot of their trade and financial networks north, into the Protestant countries of the Netherlands and England. The Nuvi were generally allied with these northern maritime uh, powers who were now on the rise, thanks to the to, you know, to Venetian help. While the Vecchi, <laughs> they were more allied with the Habsburg Empire, centered in Austro-Hungary and Spain. 
Now, the Nuvi, led by the infamous Paolo Sarpi, were also bitter enemies of the papacy and the Catholic Church in general, while the Vecchi held great positions of power in the church and claimed to defend it. Even though this Nuvi Vecchi split was real, it was actually effectively just one big counter gang operation with the Venetians controlling both sides, but definitely leaning toward you know, the Anglo Dutch. Now, the young houses of Venice knew that the old methods of Aristotle of suppressing creativity and using you know, brutal uh, suppression wouldn't cut it. So they implemented a series of economic, political, and crucially, epistemological reforms. Now, they also accelerated the religious warfare across the European continent, which burst out into genocidal horror of the 1618 to 1648 30 years war. Now, this new Venetian faction was dominated by the two most powerful families in Venice, uh, the uh, Morosine and the Contarini families. Now, even after the opening of trade routes to the riches of China and India around the Cape of Good Hope, the Venetians near the end of the 16th century still made huge fortunes, you know, from that trade, uh, from spices in particular. But you can see the extent of the assets which Venice had built up in Amsterdam and London from a proposal uh, by one of the Contarini families in the 1580s to let the British and Dutch just plain take over the spice trade, right? And it did happen, of course, is that they did finance the founding and the build-up of the Dutch and East Indy companies. As the two most powerful companies in the world during the 17th and 18th century, and even well beyond. This was all part of shifting camp, so that England would ultimately become the centre of the new Roman Empire, with London and the Bank of uh, England to be the new Apollo Temple at Delphi. This will also become clear as we go as to why England was to be the centre and not Amsterdam. Now, as Elisa established earlier, Paolo Sarpi and Antonio, Antonio Conti, in particular, were deployed as a counter-offensive to the Renaissance. Sarpi, who was the state theologian of Venice and the chief uh, theoretician for the Nuvi, well understood the superior uh, military power represented by the growing educated population using science and technology, and that therefore, right, this old form of repression of trying to just, of just trying to stop all science and technology altogether was doomed to fail. Venice, after all, had only 200,000 people, right, compared to the nation states with tens of millions of people like France. So he said, we have to take over the more populous nations, particularly the Netherlands and England, and use them for the basis for a new world ruling maritime power. And they have to be allowed to develop some science, the better to repress other nations with. Now, following 1582, and as part of the Sarpi Nuvi program, the first public bank in Venice was established. I don't have one, Jeremy. Uh, Doug. It was called the Banco della Piazza di Rialto. <laughs> uh, Rialto Tower. You want to talk about Venetian influence in, in Australia. That Grollo who built it is from, Ven is from Venice. Uh, it's sometimes called the Bank of Venice, right? Now, this was followed in 1619 by a second bank, uh, the Banco Gyro, which grad gradually absorbed the former. Now, this banking revolution was the new houses' answer to the Renaissance threat of the sovereign nation state and the utterance of their own credit. Now, under this new banking system, all of the pre 14th century usurious practices of the Lombard bankers were retained. But essentially, rather than have private family bank loans, uh, banks loan you know, money to the state, the innovation was to have the financial oligarchy simply take over the state, as in the rising powers of Holland right, and England. To eradicate any principle of national sovereignty, 
to eliminate the idea of the common good and to make the state itself an arm of the financial oligarchy. That, in essence, is the Anglo-Dutch financial system of today. The Bank of Venice became the direct inspiration for the 1609 Bank of Amsterdam and together these two banks were the model for the Bank of England in 1694. Now, historians acknowledge that around the year 1600, the Venetians had an astounding 14 million gold ducats in liquid cash, right? Uh, which is indicative of, the, of Venice shifting from commerce much more even uh, than before to a rentier, speculative economy. By 1620, Venice had become the foremost European centre as the clearinghouse of bills of exchange. Now the Venetians poured their enormous wealth north into England and Holland, but more, much more into Holland at first. They set up three institutions, which was the Bank of Amsterdam, 1609, uh, which almost all of historians admit that it was based directly on the uh, Banco del G G uh, Gyro, the Dutch East India Company, and the Amsterdam Stock Exchange or the Amsterdam Bourse, the first in the world outside Venice. Now, the Bank of Amsterdam became the most important bank in the world for the entire 17th century, as well as into the 18th century. It was dominated by less than 2,000 depositors who were Amsterdam's chief merchants. However, many of the accounts uh, held were held by Venetians undercover, in undercover names. Now, through this bank, Amsterdam controlled the world bullion market, just as Venice had done for many centuries before. The Dutch East India Company took over the trade with the East, pouring tons of, of silver into the Levant, India and China, just as Venice had done before. Through the speculation in the stocks of the Dutch East India Company and in the speculation of currencies, Venice made fortunes with virtually no risk, just like today when the hedge funders loot and pillage the economy worldwide through their control of liquidity. They also made huge for fortunes by financing all the wars that ravaged Europe uh, in the 16th and 17th centuries. Now, all wars cost money, a lot of it. And he who controls that money not only makes a fortune, but can shift the outcome of the war as desired by simply financing one side more than the other, right? Now, this is the elephant in the middle of the room, which historians almost never talk about. In their quick rise to power, the British were always fighting one another uh, uh, or another one war or another, I should say. They didn't have the money, at least not at the beginning, so who put up all the money? <laughs> all right. Hello. Well, this is, this is, you'll see how it develops, right? Because along with the creation of the Banco di Rialto and its later imita imitators in Amsterdam and London, the Venetians also established a whole system of interlinked banks across Europe, including the Bank of Hamburg, then known as the Hamburg Gyro Bank. It was founded in 1619 by Simon von Kassel, who was also known as Warburg, and a direct descendant of Abraham Dal Banco of Venice. The Bank of Nuremberg, 1621, the Bank of Stockham, 1608, and the Swedish Rich Bank, the first central bank of Europe, which was in 1668, and then of course the famous Bank of England in 1694, along with many others, right? There were a whole series of these banks. Now, the Venetians also dispersed their funds through dozens of ultra secretive private banks, usually run by one family over generations. What Venice had established were not national banks, of course but the beginnings of what we today call private central banking. Now, the institutions of the state were made subservient or more accu accurately were fused to the private banking system. This, of course, is, a is, is the essential reality behind the facade of today's liberal parliamentary system. 
The idea of the sovereign nation state was to be eliminated, eliminated to be supplanted by a world run by the financier institution, which was, of course, the new Anglo-Dutch Empire. Now, the hijacking of Britain. You know, you've no doubt, most of you, I'm sure, would have all heard of the Glorious Revolution, right? The revolution of 1688, which the Brits still today brag as the foundation of their great, glorious political and economic system. Well, it was all made in Venice. Venice organised that revolution via the so-called great Whig families who'd been allied to them for decades and even centuries. Uh, and these great Whig families basically ruled England from the death of Queen Anne in 1714 for the next 60 to 70 years. They were later called the Venetian Party by 19th century British Prime Minister, Prime Minister Disraeli but were already known uh, at the time to be closely allied to Venice. Indeed, many of them trumpeted um, you know, the fact, both in their political theory, such as their stated intent uh, to make the king a mere doge, but also in their ostentatious patronage of painting, architecture, music, and other aspects of culture that was imported from Venice. Now, Disraeli, actually said this was a vindication of the English Constitution in 1835. This is what was said. The great object of the Whig leaders in England from the first movement under Hamden to the last most successful one in 1688 was to establish in England, England a high aristocratic republic on the model of the Venetian, uh, then the study and admiration of all speculative politicians. Reed Harrington turn over Sydney and you see how the minds of the English leaders in the 17th century were saturated with Venetian type." <coughs> End of quote. For the preceding century in the lead up to the takeover of England, a flood of secret reports coming mainly from Venetian ambassadors and spies stationed uh, in England gushed about the position and wealth of England. These ambassadors were no ordinary people, but members of families that contributed doges to the Republic of Venice, and whose names were inscribed in the famous uh, Libro di Oro, the Book of Gold, right of the Venetian nobility. Their correspondence from England and Venice was always in secret and often in code. One such ambassador, Daniel Barbaro, he declared, how the island, the island of England was practically impregnable and that the sea was the island's true defence. Now other Venetian patricians uh, observed the same, including Paolo Sarpi himself, and in his maximums to the government of Venice, Sarpi declared that England is the kingdom of great strength, particularly since the Union of Scotland. All that island has the sea for a wall so that if England be not disunited within itself, there is no power to overcome it. All right. Control of England was crucial for Venetian control of Europe, where the Venetians had pitted one faction against another in bloody religious warfare. And they actually used the same tricks of orchestrated religious feuds to control England as well, a tradition of intense Protestant Catholic plots and intrigue. Right, even open, open fighting that shook Britain for the next two centuries. However, back to the Glorious Revolution. By the summer and spring of 1688, preparations were underway for the Dutch invasion of England. Now, a letter of invitation to William of Orange. A secret communication was sent by Venice's agents in England and was delivered to William requesting that he invade. In some countries, this would be called for uh, called what is flat out treason. Now, known as the Immortal Seven, these were the Venetian stooges that reassured William that this is the letter, or some of it. Oh, it's small, isn't it? Can you read it? It's okay. 
The people are so generally dissatisfied with the present conduct of the government in relation to their religion, liberties and properties. People throughout the kingdom who are desirous of change and who, we believe, would willingly contribute to it. Your Highness, that you believe you can get here time enough in a condition to give assistances this year sufficient for a relief under these circumstances which have now been represented. We who subscribe this will not fail to attend. Your Highness, upon your landing and to all, uh, and to do all that lies in, the, in our power to prepare others to be in, in, in as much readiness as such an action is capable of where there is so much danger in communicating an affair of such a nature till be near the time of its being made public. All right. Now, the leadership of the 1688 English traders were as follows. All right. I'm not going to go through them individually, but you'll hear more, a bit more about them later on. But just for starters, Edward Russell right, is the direct ancestor of Bertrand Russell. Dirty birdie, right? That LaRouche is described as the most evil man in the 20th century. Henry Compton, he's the descendant known as Lord Northampton. He's the present head of British Freemasonry. He's the controller of the Temple Mount in the Middle East, which we have um, an EIR special report that I do recommend everybody order if you haven't got it, because it'll go through the Temple Mount and their operations. Um, Lord Northampton has also revived the rituals of Alistair Crowley, the late 19th century and tw early 20th century Satanist um, and sort of British agent, uh, British intelligence. Now, I found this and I, it blew me away, right? Because uh, I don't think it's not that it's uncommon knowledge, but just because you're doing this work. He was, he proclaimed himself as a magician, right? And he wrote a book called The Book of the Sacred magic of Abramelin the Madge, which is nothing more than a revival of the entire Chaldean Magi as far as I can tell. However, back to William, his Dutch invasion fleet was massive. He had 40,000 men, massive artillery, artillery, 463 ships. William was embraced by John Churchill, First Duke of Marlborough, right? Charles Montague, Earl of Halifax, and Baron Bettany, the first Earl of Portland, who had arranged the marriage of William to Mary, the daughter of James I. Now, just so, here's the family crest, next one there please, of the Marlborough family, the Churchill crowd, the ancestry of that pig Winston, right? And look what's on it. St George, the lion, and of course the crown. As of 1688, Venice had achieved its long planned goal, transplanting the Venetian system into England. Not just the Venetian system, but the implantation of a millennia old traditions of the cult of Delphi. For instance, still today you can see adorned on the ceilings and walls of the royal family's Hampton Palace frescoes of the pagan gods championed by Julian the Apostate. The Caesars, where he celebrates the triumph of the old gods, the new, uh, the, sorry, the Caesars, where he celebrates the triumph of the old gods, the newly formed Anglo-Dutch oligarchy of the British Empire consciously adopted the J Julian Apostate's methods to destroy the, uh, the culture of the Renaissance. Right? And this is still the cultural warfare which has given us the culture of today. Now I just want to go through these quickly for time's sake. I mean they're phenomenal. I think Bob's got even got better pictures of it, have you? Go to the next. Now that's straight outside. Go back, 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 back. See the lines? <laughs> this is outside the Hampton Court guarding the palace. Next one. I'm not going to go through the different gods, but, you know, to a total extravaganza. Next one. No, this is 1688, Glorious Revolution. 
This is what William immediately got painted. Venetian artists came in and painted these on the walls of Hampton Court. Now, as I said, the British oligarchy, uh, oligarchy proudly date the founding of their Westminster system of parliamentary government to this so-called glorious revolution. This was the so-called freedom of Britain and the world, a constitutional monarchy, right? A liberal parliamentary democracy. Now, with the throne now secure on behalf of the Venetians and its allies among a small group of powerful English titled families, the great Whigs ruled through their parliament as just a mere front group. How? Well, only 180,000 people voted. <laughs> That's how. Virtually all of whom were the aristocrats, right, or their hanger honours. Uh, some of these parliamentary boroughs had only four or, or eight or 15 voters in them. <laughs> um, and uh, so you wouldn't have much <laughs> trouble with branch stacking there. <laughs> we'd, be, we'd easily get registered. Um, but, uh, of course, with the king, he made pretty much, uh, was made pretty much into a doge immediately through this parliamentary scam. And, of course, um, basically only a to about a total of 200 families ran Britain at this stage. Now what the Parliament really represented was the Grand Council of Venice, where the elected were selected and anointed by the nobility. Now um, England's new leaders after the 1688 coup were known as the Whig Jaunto. Ever heard the saying big wigs? Well this is where it comes from, right? Now they included Charles Montague, Earl of Halifax and relative of the infamous John Montague, Lord Sandwich, organiser for the settlement of Australia, or Captain Cook's trip, I should say. Robert Spencer, Lord Sunderland, as he was known. Sidney Goddolphin, Edward Russell, who was Lord, Lord Oxford. Thomas Wharton, John Summers, and many others. Now, the Whig Jaunto moved rapidly to step-by-step -step transform Britain along Venetian lines. As of 1688, they permanently cut back royal uh, revenues in a big way, making the crown dependent upon the parliament, right? By 1689, parliament passed the Declaration of Rights Act, which reserves the, uh, to parliament control over the finances of the realm, including the power to raise taxes and which limited the military authority of the king. Right, so everything was being transferred to the parliament that was controlled by the nobility. Right. If the king doesn't control the finances of the army, what does he control? In that same year, the British, in alliance with the Dutch, declared war against the French. In 1690, John Locke, who copied all of his so-called great philosophical writings straight out of the book by Paolo Sarpi, published the two treaties on government. And by 1695, after the founding of the Bank of England in 1694, he was given the job of the great recoinage. <laughs> Incredulously, Locke ran one of the biggest scams ever. He called for all silver coins to be handed in, melted them down, and then issued new silver coins, right, which had a, mental co a, a metal content of to, the, uh, to equal the face value of the coin. Whereas before, the face value was much higher than the metal contact for various historical reasons. All right? Now, two things happened. First, the average citizen didn't receive the new coins until several months later <laughs> and was so utterly desperate in the meantime, as you can imagine. But then, when they finally got the new coins, their value was far less than what had been handed in, right, because the currency had been devalued. Now, those who had liquid assets or uh, uh, access to the Bank of England, while no one else had any money because Locke had called it in, could buy up pretty much anything they wanted for pennies on the dollar because people were so desperate, right? Now, Locke had an unindicted co-conspirator as they say in the United States, in this scam. And his name was Isaac Newton. <laughs> and he was the head of the Royal Mint. 
Now, 1697 saw the establishment of the Board of Trade and the plantations that led uh, to, by 1698, the founding of the new East India Company that was dominated by the Whig Junto, Junto, which took over the previously existing old East India Company. Now, Charles Montague had succeeded in raising the revenue for the king and army by navigating through the commons a two million pound flotation. Guess who would have um, been buying the bonds? Charles Montague was one of the key players who brought about the great British so-called financial revolution of 1694 to 1698, which all the British loving uh, historians brag about. Now, I can't give you all the details here, but it was just one big, giant, outrageous scam, you know, after the other. The whole thing was pivoted on the three institutions, the three pillars of the British Empire as they were known, the Bank of England, the East India Company, and the Exchequer, right? Uh, two of the pillars were overtly in private hands, but the third, the Exchequer, along with the Treasury, right, effectively was also, since it depended on the other two for most of its funds. <coughs> so it was controlled, indirectly but directly. In fact, the very term Prime Minister derives right from the first Lord of the Treasurer, who was always the number one guy in the Cabinet and became known as Prime, prime First Minister uh, after Sir Robert Walpole, uh, who through immense corruption and patronage ran England for the Whigs basically from 1720s into the 1740s. But even once they became known as Prime Ministers, their actual main responsibility was still to the First Lord of the Treasury. Treasury. So all the governments, all the government was, was a front for the financiers. Right. In fact, maybe that's where we get the term prime interest rate. <laughs> From, you know, the, the only one offered to the First Lord of the Treasury. All right. Okay, Bank of England. So the Bank of England uh, became a modern central bank on the model of the Venetians uh, that it established in 1582. The relationship between the bank and the treasury was direct. The Bank of England became the main issuer of credit. It was the, uh, it was the banked, uh, bank of discount, deposit and note issue. It was created in the first place by a handful of merchants who put up some money to finance King William's insane wars against France in what has to be close to the biggest scams in history. Uh, the promised, uh, uh, to, they promised to put up 1.2 million pounds in return for which they got the charter to run the bank. Uh, but they only actually put up a pittance of their own money. And then, once they were given the right to um, uh, form a bank, uh, they just printed bank money and gave that to the government. Right. As a result of the great financial revolution of the 1690s, the English were given a permanent national debt for the first time ever. Right. In fact, the British Crown is now likely, you know, now killing off British, you know, citizens in the droves right through the country's genocidal health system to save money, right, in order to pay the national debt. A debt which is derived from this day, 1688. Oh, well right. Yeah. Now, next one. Partnered with the Bank of England was the newly formed East, uh, New East India Company of 1698. This was formed to take over the old uh, British East India Company, since the old British East India Company had been closely allied with the Stuarts. Treasurer Sidney God, uh, Goddolphin greatly uh, enhanced the power of the company when in 1708 he sponsored an agreement for extensive trading privileges in return uh, for a £3.2 million pound loan to the government. Now, given how the Bank of England was set up, you wonder what uh, that loan was all about or whether it even happened. The co colonisation drive of the New East India Company was nothing more than a private army for the Venetian oligarchy run through the Parliament of Britain. Right? 
the British East India Company commissioned this 1778 painting by Venetian artist Roma, Spiridoni, Dioni, uh, Roma, for the painting of the ceiling of its revenue committee room. So this sort of confirms what I was saying before. Um, it's titled, The East Offering Its Riches to Britannia. It celebrates Britain, Britain's world imperial rule after 1763 on the model of ancient Rome. The pagan god Mercury, right? Um, uh, on the, his, uh, his staff is commanding the enslaved of Asia, as you see, right? To, to deliver tribute to Britannia, the mother goddess of England. Yeah, <laughs> old fames, old father fames. And that's a British East India Company in the background. However, you, see, you know, people would probably walk into this building and think, oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> However, the 1688 Glorious Revolution was basically phase one of the establishment of Britain as the headquarters of the Neo-Venetian Empire. For Venice to consolidate its financial combine, they unleashed cultural warfare where the Council of Ten, the Venetian Council of Ten, uh, dispatched dozens, if not hundreds, of Venetian painters, architects, interior decorators, etc., to all the major centres or courts of Europe to spread Venice's anti golden Renaissance culture all over. They were operating as they did in the courts and the homes of most of the prominent nobility of each country. Now, many of the British oligarchic, uh, oligarchical families prior to the Glorious Revolution had sent their sons on grand tours of Europe. But this practice, as well as that official name, only became institutionalised after Venice's Glorious Revolution of 1688. Its purpose was to integrate the Venice-allied great Whig families and other British oligarchs into the continental-wide oligarchy, right? Uh, the roster of whose inner sanctum, as we, I said earlier, was the Venetian Libro di Oro, its book of gold, the register of all the Venetian noble families, which of course now was including those families from across Europe whom the Venetians had adopted and accorded are the signal, a single distinction of becoming formal members of the Venetian oligarchy. Now, just as the Venetians view themselves as the new Romans, continuing the imperial traditions of the Roman Empire, so did the new imperial rulers of Britain. Now, there's a very useful book uh, by Monash University historian in Australia, Philip Ayres, entitled Classical Culture, and the idea of Rome in the 18th century, in which he shows how extensively the British oligarchy of that era modelled themselves on the Roman Empire. He concludes that the British century from 1688 must rank as outstanding in the degree to which its cultural and political elite appropriated and assimilated classical, classical and particularly Roman habits of mind. For example, he said, in the British Senate, the great parliamentary orators of the age were commonly identified with the Greek or Roman prototypes. Charles James Fox was the English Demosthenes, who was a student of Aristotle and attacked Plato, in whose works he was known to be steeped. William Pitt the Elder was also compared to Demosthenes, as well as Cicero, known as the great Roman orator. Richard Brinsley Sheridan was uh, Hyperides. Next in rank was to <laughs> Demosthenes or an improved Tactus, senator of the Roman Empire. Right? Now, the new Roman imperial modelled cultural standards were fostered and developed via a series of societies and clubs established by the who's who of the Whig families as the notorious, notoriously satanic Hellfire Club the Dilettante Society, a club that, so, that was so powerful that it was known just as the club, and various royal societies and academies. 
Now, the first official club uh, which wielded real power was the Kit Kat Club, founded in the late 1680s to the early 1690s. Now, the club, like many that followed, boasted a, a, a list of the most powerful aristocratic families in England and of their financier allies in leading banks and the East India Company. These clubs and their members participated in the cultural, constitutional and social revolutions of their time. In all, pagan rituals and satanic rituals were practiced by all members. In fact, that's what qualified you for membership. In fact, many of the Kit Kat Club members were the key players that either were involved in delivering the orders uh, to bring William of Orange to England on behalf of the Venetians or follow through uh, with the implementation of the Venetian political system. They included Jacob uh, Tonson, founding member of and leading publisher fig publishing figure of the day, William Cavendish, who was one of the organisers via Venice for William's invasion, Spencer Crom uh, Compton, the second Earl of Northampton, whom you uh, heard a little bit about earlier, but he was also the father of Henry Compton, who also organised William's invasion. The Montague families, later members of the Hellfire Club, Charles Sackville, 6th Earl of Dorset, Thomas Wharton again, J Joseph Addison and Richard Steele. Richard Boyle III, Earl of Burlington, was called the Apollo of the Arts. <laughs> Richard Temple, Viscount Cobham, he brought a whole number of Venetian painters, architects, interior decorators, etc., to build a huge house and gardens dedicated to Greek and Roman gods and there were a litany of poets that came in, right? Now, I'm going to shock some of you, but <laughs> uh, it will really uh, demonstrate the culture that we have today. Now, founded upon drinking and eating, a typical ritual was not only a toast to Wiggery, but also uh, a reigning society beauty who would have her name engraved on each glass. The engravings of the glasses would often include the words Bacchus or Venus. As you know, uh, Bacchus was just the Roman name for uh, Dionysus. He was the Roman god of drunkenness and irrational frenzy, the god that comes and presides over the communication between the living and the dead, right? Venus was the goddess of lust. Those chosen to be toasted were the children or the wives or, the, or nieces of the members, and it can be left to no one's imagination what the toasting would encounter when one Kit Kat member wrote a letter to a paper protesting that it was a gentleman's natural privilege to fornicate with little, raw, unthinking girls. Richard Steele went on to say that women should consider themselves as they ought no other than an additional part of the species, as shining ornaments to their fathers, husbands, brothers and children. Above all, one of the key aspects of the imported habits of cultural and sexual degeneracy and the celebration of Roman culture was to obliterate the Shakespearean legacy, which existed in England from that English Renaissance led by Henry VII. For instance, uh, the Kit Kat Club's Jacob Tonson was one of the founders and leading publisher sponsored the rewriting of Shakespeare's plays that punctuated out uh, the idea of metaphor. Now, I've done enough research to say unequivocally that that was the case, and it was directly led by Antonio Conti, right, that in turn then led to a further assassinations of Shakespeare's works by Alexander Pope and Samuel Johnson, as well as others. Why? Well, aside from the great power of his work, you know, as, as art, right, Shakespeare had written much about the Venetians in his plays or about Venetian methods, right, such as The Merchants of Venice, Ortello, The Moor of Venice, and Julius Caesar, just to name a few. And, of course, during Shakespeare's own lifetime, as well as later in the 18th century, there was a revival, right, of Shakespeare, that, that, and they were mass 
the mass organisers, the mass educationals. Shakespeare was educating the masses through classical drama, by which they would emerge from his plays as better people. 3,000 people a day, right, would pack the, the, the theatre six days a week to watch Shakespeare's plays. So they really were mass educationals. Now, following the Kit Kat Club, the Hellfire Clubs were then founded by the inner core of the very, very worst of the oligarchy in Britain that were tied to Venice. The first Hellfire Club was founded in 1721 by Philip II, Duke of Wharton, whose father had been one of the bigwig oligarchs who'd organised the 1688 Glorious Revolution. And of course, the second was founded by Francis Dashwood himself. Now, Dashwood was born in 1708. He was the grandson of Francis Dashwood, who'd been a top figure in the British East India Company. And he was also a, very, a personal associate of John Locke, right? Now, as Lynn said, the Hellfire Club was a typical religious church of the era and also of the British Empire today. In fact, the British have published a whole number of books over the part, last couple of decades which are hysterical defences of the Hellfire Club. Now, I mentioned the institution of the Grand Tour by which the young British oligarchs were integrated into the families of the Venice-centred oligarchy of Europe in continental manners, right? Now, when Dashwood went on his grand tour, he came back to London and he founded the Hellfire Club, which existed from the 1740s into the 1770s, which, as Daniel Mannix, one of the most you know, colourful authors of the club, said, was founded to be a secret group directing the fate of the nation, a sort of invisible empire operating behind the scenes of government. And it quite clearly did play that role. Yeah. That's an over uh, aerial shot of where the Hellfire Club is. It was established in the 12th century, in a ruin of the 12th century, uh, um, um, which Dashwood, Dashwood had rebuilt, right? This was a Cistercian, sister, 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 Cistercian, is it? Yeah, um, which I think is one of the old Roman uh, appendages. But anyway, he rebuilt this entire area. His members were called the Monks of Medmaham, uh, and it was a witting attack on Christianity. Now, remember Mithra and the Mithraic caves? Well, this had a series of underground tunnels as well, leading to an inner in a, a temple with walls adorned with Roman numer numerals. Inside the uh, inner temple, there were black masses, sodomy and general sexual perversions were practiced. For the outside gardens, there are three temples erected in celebration of Apollo. You can go to the next one if you like, please, Jeremy. Um, you know, Apollo, uh, Venus, Bacchus, whilst inside to the Mithra gods, which that bottom one there is part of the uh, adaptation to the myth Mithraic gods of slaying of the bull. He's riding it for obvious reasons. Um, <laughs> you'll see why in a minute. Um, now, of course, um, this ch uh, for, this ch for his church that stood on the grounds, the glass-stained windows had the 12 apostles in costume, each in some indecent pose. Inscribed over the door of the chapels were the words in Latin. Stranger, refuse, if you can, what we have to offer. Right. With Roman rooms and underground caves, Dashwood and his crew could, not celebrate their, could now celebrate their satanic views, as John Milton said in his oh-so-famous epic poem, Paradise Lost. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. And that they did practicing exactly what one historian noted about the Magi priesthood, that the Magi specified that evil must be worshipped also 
and must be considered. Now, just with black masses, where a woman would be laid naked on the altar while they drank from skulls, uh, but sexual orgies where the women would be masked, others dressed as nuns, and then the men would pick their choice. Now, the masked women included their sisters and wives, mothers and daughters, and it's been said that Hellfire Francis slept with his own mother. They had a breaking, breaking in house, which Lord Sandwich, remember the guy that organised Captain Cook's true, uh, crew, uh, uh, trip to Australia? He himself boasted that the corruption of innocence for its own sake is necessary because he enjoyed it. While Sandwich had his breaking in house, Dashwood had his baboon. Yep, they have an ape. While, <laughs> while practicing their black masses, there were members who practiced religious rites by sodomizing an ape. The ape who was wearing women's clothing got loose and ran around the local town, which caused a big scandal, right? Now, you can, you can imagine why the ra ape ran away, but after they recaptured the ape, it remained at the club for many years and was regarded as an object of veneration. <laughs> Now, I guess Dashwood thought it was better sleeping, um, you know, uh, thought it was better than sleeping with his mother. Maybe, it, you know, maybe it was, you know, a bit better looking, you know, because he did sleep with his mother. She was picked out of, with the mask on, right? Okay, if we go to the next one. Um, this is what's known as Sir Francis and his devotions, right? And at first glance, one would say, well, what is, you know, this looks all right. <laughs> Well, let's go through it. <laughs> in, in fact, he, whenever he was in the Hellfire Club, he was dressed as a friar, right? Now, the intent of Dashwood and of club life in general was to destroy the concept of Christianity or any classic culture follow, classical uh, culture follow, flowing from there. At, as I said, at first appearance, one might say that this is just a picture of someone dressed as a monk. However, let's take a closer look and you'll just see how shockingly satanic it is. Now, look at the woman, how she appears to be laying on an altar, right? Think of Venus, the celebrated goddess of Venus. If you look at the composition of the pile of exotic fruit, down the bottom here, have a look at the pear. It doesn't leave much to the imagination, right? Then look at the crucifix dangling from the rope. Um, and of course, um, on, of pearls. If you think of the branch with the ribbon tied on it, what does image does that create for you with the woman laying on the altar there? I'm going to let you draw your conclusions, which is actually the reality. The book that Dashwood is holding, this book here, it's not the Bible. What it is, it's the book of, of John Wilmot, the second Earl of Rochester, who was the notorious sexual pervert, pervert of the Restoration period. The Venetian spy, Casanova, who frequently visited England, said that this book featured significantly in his life. It was circulating widely throughout Europe, and it was simply known as Missouris, I think. And Missouris was the used... Um, um, Suderman, as it was a provocative reference to the Council of Trent, allowing the Roman Catholic devout to read pornographic material in order to improve their, uh, the literary style. Now, one of the, the, the many things that Sarpy induced, actually, right? You have at the back there the carnival mask of Venice. In the halo above, Guess whose face that is? It's the evil image of Lord Sandwich looking on. Right? Now, Sandwich was also a member of the Hellfire Club. Now, um, da Dashwood, he'd always wear this habit, as I said, when he, you know, indulging in any sexual depravity. And it was said that uh, Lord Bolingbroke, another member of the Hellfire Club, Right, would often say when excusing himself for indulgencies, 
would say he was going uh, to his devotions. All right, now, Noel's going to be doing a bit on Pope, I think, this, you there? Yeah, this afternoon. But Pope was said to have celebrated Dashwood's devotions in both his Rape of the Lock and his Epistle to Burlington. Now, in his epistle, he describes something similar uh, to the Venus-adored woman on the altar when he says, On painted ceilings you devoutly stare, where sprawl the saints of Verio and Lenguer. On gilded clouds in fair expansion lie, and bring all paradise before your eye. In Pope's Rape of the Lock, he says, on her white breast a sparkling cross she wore, which Jew, Jews might kiss and infidels adore. All right, so I think um, Noel will have fun with Mr Pope. However, the whole point of this club and others to follow was wittingly to continue the tradition of the old Temple of Apollo at Delphi, the dominant cult centre of ancient Greece and the Mediterranean. On Dashwood's second grand tour, when he visited Venice in 1732, he founded another club known as the Dilettante Society, whose stated purpose was to purify the culture and morals of Britain. <laughs> Once again, this club was deeply steeped in the worshipping of pagan gods. Now, uh, this is by, I've forgotten his first name, Elisa uh, Nazari. Uh, Bartholomew, Bar Bartolomo. Uh, this is on board the ship. It, this is done at about 1732 or thereabouts when Dashwood and his friends were sailing to Venice. Um, as I said, Nazari was uh, commissioned to record the foundation of the Dilettante Society. He painted several copies of the picture showing the group of gentlemen uh, on board the ship at Genoa, which of course the three identified figures are none other than Francis da Dashwood, Lord Middlesex and Lord Boyne. Now, this dilettante society who worshipped the pagan god of Bacchus was one of the most powerful and wealthiest clubs in England. Its membership included Sir William Hamilton, Edward Gibbon, Lord Montague, Joshua Ran Reynolds, James Boswell, Joseph Banks, who was also a member of the Hellfire Club, Edmund Burke, uh, many members of the Hellfire Club and many, many, many others including the so-called founder of the modern English language, Samuel Johnson. Right, now for the next half century or more, the dilettante established almost all the cultural institutions and figures whom you've heard about in the English language history in painting, in architecture, in music, in archaeology, in classical studies, in drama, and so forth. These included the Royal Academy of Art, Britain's main cultural body uh, to this day, and such individual figures as Dr Samuel Johnson, who single-handedly invented the dictionary and spearheaded a drive to destroy Shakespeare. The British oligarchy promoted Johnson to be the cultural dictator of Britain. And in the, words of, uh, in the words of one of them, in fact, Johnson's first literary effort uh, was to glorify Sarpy in, in Venice. Now, Samuel Johnson, you got him up there? Oh, thanks. He, rev he revered uh, Joseph Addison, who was the later founder of the Spectator magazine. And in 1713, Addison wrote the tragedy Cato, in which Johnson wrote numerous reviews. Cato was a Roman politician during the reign of Julius Caesar. In one review, Johnson celebrates the fact that when one feels oppression from those he knows to be his superiors, he could seek Bacchus and be able to preserve himself from being enslaved. As regards to Johnson's political outlook, he told his friend and biographer, James Boswell, a man who has not been to Italy is always conscious of an inferiority from is not having seen what is expected a man should see. The grand object of travelling is to see the shores of the Mediterranean. On these shores were the four great empires of the world, the Assyrian, 
the Persian, the Grecian and the Roman, all of our religion, almost all of our law, almost all of our arts, almost all that sets us above savages has come from us from the shores of the Mediterranean. Now, in other words, Johnson says civilization is just a succession of glorious empires. And when he says Greece, right, you know he's not referring, going back to the Greece of Socrates and Plato, right, you know, but to the Peloponnesian War, which established Greece as a short-lived and doomed empire. But Johnson and his crew weren't just calling for empire. They were calling for the continued traditions of the cult of the magic priesthood. And that's the case still today. It, you know, and, and, and it's, it has to be conscious to all of us. But is it? But it sure is hell for those who are spreading the disease, right? Now, there's one last thing, a couple of things just to conclude with. John Maynard Keynes, which you've all heard about, he was the British economist who called for the World Central Bank in opposition to Roosevelt's Bretton uh, Woods credit system and declared in his worship of Isaac Newton when Newton's chess papers were finally opened and it was discovered that he was an occultist. Well, this is what Keynes actually said, glowingly said of Newton. Newton was not the first of the age of reason. He was the last of the magicians, the last of the Babylonians, the last great mind that looked out on the visible and intellectual world with the same eyes as those who began to build our intellectual inheritance rather less than 10,000 years ago. John Maynard Keynes, speaking of Newton, you know, this is, this is only yesterday. Deliberate traditions still sponsored by the oligarchy. <laughs> now, what I would like to say, we're really pushed for time, and Noel's very short. <laughs> but it wasn't my fault. I only, I've only taken two hours. <laughs> Um, now that we've tra no, hang on, we've travelled through history. That um, you know what this it doesn't have to be like this. Our culture doesn't have to be de degenerate and evil. Look at you know look what Robbie went through yesterday. Look what Lisa presented you know just before. Um, it wasn't an ancient history this crap, right, this evil. It, well, before the institution of oligarchism was created, it wasn't there, it didn't exist, right? Because it, it, when mankind developed astrogation, it means that, um, you know, if we can't adopt that idea now, then our children and those who come after us are not going to have a future. And what I, you know, I hope I've demonstrated to you is that this evil, this degenerate culture, is a deliberate creation of the oligarchy. So, with uh, that in mind, I think I um, uh, might hold questions off till. Yeah, so that. <laughs>